It's a new year, and Governor Kate Brown is beginning her new term as governor. She enters the year with the wind at her back, with Democratic supermajorities in both the Oregon House and Senate. With Democrats firmly in control, progressives have high hopes for the legislative session that starts later this month. Brown has laid out her priorities in her proposed budget, including protecting Oregon's environment, fighting homelessness, reducing class sizes, and more. The governor joins us tonight to discuss. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and Happy New Year and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. With this show, we mark 10 years of Straight Talk. In January of 2009, then Oregon Governor Ted Kulongoski was our first guest. The state was in the middle of a tough recession in 2009. The budget was strained, but as it is today, education was top of mind. Governor Kulongoski saw it as a top priority. Here's what he told me 10 years ago. Well, what you have to do is you have to prioritize. And uh, I, I wish I could tell you that all things were equal in government, and that doesn't mean that they're not all important, but some things are more important than others. And I think that you have to build a protective wall around education and its budget to see that these children have the opportunity uh, that they're going to need to be able to provide uh, the uh, future that we all want, because they are our human infrastructure. The, the state is built upon them. Fast forward 10 years and we're all a little bit older and <laughs> education is still not where Oregonians want it to be. Newly reelected Governor Kate Brown has made education a top priority as well. As we mark 10 years of straight talk, we're pleased to welcome Governor Brown as our guest. We'll look ahead to her first year of her new term and her plans for Oregon's future. Great to have you here. Thank you, Laurel. I'm delighted to be here. Congratulations on your 10 years and happy new year. Well, thank you and same to you. Well, I'm gonna go back to election night for just a moment and, and we watched your victory speech and you looked jubilant. <laughs> you could see the joy on your face. How do you feel? What are you thinking as you enter this new year and a new term? I'm incredibly honored to have the support of Oregonians to serve four more years as their governor. I met with Jimmy Carter this, uh, this summer and I asked him what his favorite job was in his entire lifetime of 94 years. And he said, being governor, there's no better job in the world. A lot of people are saying it's time for you to be bold. You beat Newt Bueller by 100,000 votes. They say you have a, a mandate. It's time to, that you have an opportunity to really make uh, Oregon better by the year 2022. What do you see now as your sense of purpose? Well, I truly believe that by working together, we can build a better Oregon. And as Governor Kulongowski referenced, we have to invest in our education system. And Oregon is truly at a turning point. The economy is doing quite well, and we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in our state's history. Our job growth rate is solid, and it is time for us to make a significant investment in our education system. And my budget calls for a $1.9 billion investment in creating what I call a seamless system of education from cradle to career. We know that by investing in early childhood, both in early childhood education and care and supports like home visitation, our children can show up to kindergarten ready to learn. We have to do that for our families that are struggling. We need to reduce class sizes in K through three. The data is very clear there as well. And of course, we need a longer school year. I have to tell you, the high school students aren't very excited about it, but parents and teachers are, and that's what's important. And if we can make these investments, we can improve outcomes for all of our students. Also key for me is making sure that we invest in career and technical education, hands-on learning. Oregonians supported ballot measure 98 uh, to ensure that every single high school student has access to hands-on learning. We need to fully fund this program. What's so important about it is that when Oregon students have access to hands-on learning, they wanna stay in high school and they graduate 
and also very importantly, they come out of high school uh, ready uh, for the future and provide our workforce with the diversity and skilled labor that it needs. And I want to ask you more about education and the budget and dig into that a little bit in a moment. But first, I have to ask you about some news that broke mm -hmm. late this week, some troubling news, a report from the Bureau of Labor and Industries that says that state leadership in Oregon of the legislature allowed a sexually hostile work environment. I want to backtrack just a little bit because this comes a year after sexual harassment allegations surfaced at the Oregon legislature where state Senator Sarah Gelser, who accused then Senator Jeff Cruz of sexual misconduct. She says the culture in Salem has not improved and the Boley report says that the leadership created a culture that discourages people from reporting sexual harassment. Governor, I know you feel very strong about the topic of sexual harassment. This report has to be deeply troubling to you. It is very, very concerning, and I need to be very, very clear. Sexual harassment, harassment of any kind in the workplace, whether it's in the Capitol or in our courtrooms or in our classrooms, is absolutely unacceptable. I think we need to use every single tool that we have to change culture. One of the reports that I look to is the Oregon Law Commission report. They recommended that the legislature create an office of equity so that folks who are being harassed have a safe, confidential, and independent place to go get the help that they need to make sure that the uh, workplace action that is harassing them is stopped immediately. In that report, Sarah Gelser says that leadership, when she told them about these complaints, dismissed her, did not support her. One leader yelled at her. Another leader told her to deal with it. Another leader said she wasn't likable, so maybe she wouldn't get support. How do you feel about your leadership, that this was the response? I know that President Courtney and Speaker Kotek are working on implementing the recommendations from the Oregon Law Commission and making sure that the Capitol is a workplace that people feel safe and comfortable. I certainly can't speak to Senator Gelser's concerns, but I certainly am concerned that um, everyone, regardless of their position, whether they're a state senator or an intern, feel safe in our state capitol. The report was specifically critical of Senator Courtney and House Speaker Kotek. Will you hold them accountable? I think it is important. I know they are very concerned that they are working on implementing the recommendations and I will wake, work with them to make sure that all of the recommendations from the Law Commission are implemented. Do you think the legislature should take any kind of action against the leadership, like a rebuke or something like that? Here's what I would say. Culture change is very difficult and it takes all of us. It takes training and education. I made sure that all of my employees went through that training by the end of the year. We're making sure that all of our state agencies have consistent policies in place. We want to make sure that people who feel uncomfortable, that feel that they are being harassed at work, um, have a safe place to report and that appropriate action is being taken. But are you personally disappointed in, in your leadership? I, I'm certainly concerned about the report. I haven't had a time to fully evaluate the report. It came out yesterday. Um, certainly, I know Speaker Kotek, the Senate President, they are working hard to ensure that everyone in the state capitol feels safe. Brad Avakian uh, is the Labor Commissioner. Today was his last day. We're talking mm -hmm. on Friday, so Val Hoyle takes over on Monday. Uh, will you make sure that that report gets followed up on when Val Hoyle takes over? Absolutely, and I've talked with uh, Commissioner-elect Val Hoyle. She's being sworn in on Monday of next week. I know that this issue is a top priority for her, and I'm confident that she will take the action she deems necessary. So let's go back to, to education because that is your top priority. You talked a little bit about it. You've talked at, it, during the campaign about lengthening the school year. You mentioned it just a moment ago, reducing class size. How soon do you think we can see those changes? Next year, the year after? Well, we're already, we know we're making progress, that we're improving outcomes for our high school students. What I want to see is greater improvement over the next handful of years. Um, for me, uh, being successful is making sure that we have an education system that we are proud of, that 
every student graduates from high school with a plan for their future and the tools to compete in our global economy, that's going to take investment. I'm working to bring our folks in the business community, our labor community, our legislators, all together about the specific type of investments that are needed to produce the outcomes. Let's talk specifically about those investments, nearly $2 billion. Senate President Peter Courtney told the AP lawmakers will move forward with a multi-billion dollar tax plan, either a value added tax, I think New Hampshire has something like that, or a gross receipts tax. Is there something you prefer as far as a way to fund this? I have a couple of principles that I feel strongly about. Number one, that any kind of revenue proposal that we move forward on doesn't already burden our hardworking, struggling Oregon families and our economy is growing right now, we want to make sure that it keeps growing into the future. There are a couple things I think we need to do first. Number one, we need to get agreement and alignment on the type of investments we want to make in our education system. I've laid out key priorities around early childhood, uh, uh, making sure that we reduce class sizes and the grades K through three, that we increase the school year and that we invest in career and technical education. I think the legislature and it's somewhat in agreement with that, but we want to make sure that the business community, that uh, stakeholders, and, and you're educators, working with Nike on that too, yes, aren't you? Absolutely, Nike absolutely. We're working with the entire business community that is willing to come to the table and say, now is the time. Oregon is at a turning point, and it is now that we need to make significant investments to make sure that our students have the tools they need to succeed. And, and you mentioned making sure that this doesn't hit average Oregonians because that's what House Minority Leader Carl Wilson is saying that your plan is going to hit hardworking Oregonians in the wallet and the pocketbook and any tax plan could end up back on the ballot. So how do you make sure it, it doesn't affect consumers? Well, I think that's how we, we go through the legislative process and I use what the work we did around the transportation package as an example. We got agreement from communities around the state, from mayors and community leaders, from the business community, that we were going to make three investments in our education system, that we were going to reduce congestion, that we were going to invest in public transit in every community around the state, and that we were going to make sure that our roads and bridges would withstand earthquakes, a 9.0 earthquake. And we were able to come together around those key investments and then come up with a funding proposal that had the support of a substantial amount of uh, stakeholders and the business community and legislators. We're going to do the same thing for education, but I think what is so important is that we do it now while the economy is doing well. If we, we know that if we face, a, as we face a downturn, that it's going to be very difficult to make these investments, so the time is now. We need to decide what kind of state we want to be, and I want to be a state where we can be proud of our education system. You you mentioned being bipartisan with the transportation package. Is that important to you because you do have super majorities in both chambers? You could just steamroll through and do anything that you want to. Is it important to you to reach out to the other side? That's not how I operate. I like to work across the aisle and around the state. I think the public policy that is bipartisan, that reflects the interests of Democrats and Republicans, of rural and urban Oregonians, is much better public policy. It's more resilient, it's more reflective of our communities, and it's certainly more respectful. Like you said, any of these proposals could end up on the ballot. Um, we saw that with Ballot Measure 101, the funding proposal for the Oregon Health Plan, and the coalition that we were able to build to ensure funding for health care for over 400,000 Oregonians was successful. That's the kind of coalition that we need to invest in our education system. We have to, in this discussion, talk about PERS reform. It came up a lot during the campaign. Oregonians might not be willing to support any tax hike if they don't see any reform in the rising pension costs. It's estimated, especially with the stock market right now, that unfunded liability could grow to $26 billion this year. The Oregonian editorial board wrote this about the need for PERS reform. It said, even with the record state revenue that you mentioned, Governor, unsustainable pension obligations are crushing schools, county health departments, state social service agencies, 
agencies and hundreds of other public employers that are already cutting employees to balance budgets. As required contributions increase over the next several budget cycles, those burdens will cut deeper and deeper. There are few problems that fall so squarely within the governor's authority to address and within her obligation to fix. You promised during the campaign and during the KGW debate you are not interested in cutting compensation salaries of firefighters and teachers. So what will you do to try to bring these rising pension costs under control? My focus in terms of PERS, the Public Employee Retirement System, is to make sure that we stabilize employer rates for K-12 schools and for our state system. And the best thing we can do to make that happen is to tackle the unfunded actuarial liability. That's the debt we owe to our retirees. And the courts have said, we have to keep our promises to those retirees. And I know that Oregonians agree with me on this one. That's why we worked with Republicans and Democrats to craft legislation that swept and continues to sweep unanticipated revenue and to help uh, create a side account to pay down uh, or to buy down employer rates for K through 12 schools. We uh, provided a sweetening, uh, a pot uh, for jurisdictions around the state, for cities and counties to pay down their unfunded actuarial liability. But I think there's more that we can do and we're gonna continue to work together uh, to make sure that we tackle these issues in a way that is legally viable and keeps our promises to Oregon retirees. All this is against the backdrop of a possible recession. You mentioned it. Um, a lot of experts say we might see one as soon as early as next year. And now there's some discussion about maybe ending the kicker check because we had great revenues this year and it's estimated that an average Oregonian making 36,000 a year would get a $175 tax credit next year. But momentum's building to kill the kicker and then sort of divert that money into a rainy day fund for times when we have a recession. Do you support that movement to kill the kicker and put that into a rainy day fund? I'm certainly uh, aware that those conversations are occurring. My focus is making sure that Oregonians know that their tax dollars are being well spent. And so we're really focused right now on how do we ensure that every single taxpayer dollar is being spent effectively and efficiently. What a lot of people don't know, in my first couple of years as governor, we were able to reduce the cost of state government, save nearly a half a billion dollars. So I am focused on making sure that my state agency leaders are doing everything they can to ensure that dollars are being well spent, that we're delivering services more effectively and efficiently to Oregonians across the state, and that we're driving better outcomes for Oregonians. So just quickly, if, if the legislature did pass uh, a, a, a bill to kill the kicker, would you sign it? Yes, no, maybe. Well, that's a great question, Laurel, but the issue is if, uh, if, we, if we change the kicker, it's in the Constitution, and so it would go directly to Oregonians. Uh, I think that's a conversation worth having, and uh, I look forward to that conversation. All right, Governor, time for us to take a break, but we'll continue our conversation with Governor Brown on this 10-year anniversary of Straight Talk. We're back in two minutes.